Hello, everyone, and welcome to class this morning. This will be our last class uh, for this semester and the last class for all of you because you're the final year students. So let's begin. Uh, we'll begin with a word of prayer. Can one of you please lead us in prayer, please? Anyone? Elisha, can you lead us in prayer, please? Thank you, ma'am. Our Lord and Master Jesus, we want to thank you and bless you for all that you have con you have con provided and all that you have done for us throughout the semester. Father, we are committing the rest of our days into your hands. So God, we pray that you come and take control, lead us, continue to guide us, continue to be our great teacher who will help us to understand whatever we are being taught. We pray, commit our pastor into your hands. Father, continue to grant her the clear utterances that she will be able to make and transfer knowledge, wisdom, and understanding to us. We pray that, Lord, O oh God, continue to let your Holy Spirit come and guide us. Holy Spirit, come and teach us. And let your Holy Spirit comfort us in the mighty name of jesus father we thank you and we bless you for answered prayer amen amen thank you elisha uh last monday we began uh, studying the book of uh, philemon paul's personal letter uh, to philemon and we looked at the introduction and uh, we did a word study uh, or a phrase study or verse study till um, verse 4. Uh, we'll continue today. So before we begin, can one of you please read verses 4 to verse 7, please? Philemon, there's only one chapter. So chapter 1, verses 4 to 7. Can one of you please read Philemon, chapter 1, verses 4 to 7, please? Yes. I thank my God always when I remember you in prayers because I, I hear of your love and of the faith that you have toward the Lord Jesus and for all the saints. And I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. For I have they write much joy and comfort from your love, my brother, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. Amen. So we looked at, uh, studied verse 4 uh, last uh, Monday. We look at verse 5 where Paul is writing to Philemon saying, you know, that he's heard of uh, his love and faith which he has towards uh, the Lord Jesus Christ and towards all the saints. So. In the epistle of Colossians, Paul uh, mentions that, you know, he, he has heard the faith of the church and their love for all the saints so that he's uh, writing specifically uh, to the church, to the saints, to the believers at Colossae saying that he's heard of their faith, how they're growing in their faith and also their love for the saints. Uh, and there he's mentioning about the church in general. But here when he's writing to Philemon, he's personally saying that, you know, he's heard uh, of how Philemon shares his love with, uh, you know, with believers, with the people around him uh, and the faith that he has towards the Lord uh, Jesus Christ. Paul was the one who led uh, uh, Philemon uh, to Christ. Uh, and we see that, you know, Philemon has grown in his faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and uh, his faith has demonstrated itself in a very deep love uh, for his uh, uh, fellow human beings, those who are part of the church, the saints, the believers, those who are, um, you know, people living around him. Uh, and But especially those who, uh, you know, are in Christ. He shares the love of God with them. So the love of God, you know, in and through us is actually a proof of our conversion 
and also that you know we are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. So that is the characteristic, the main characteristic of God. God is love. We read that in First John, uh, in many scripture passages in First John, that God is love. That you know the, His basic core structure of who He is is that He's a God of love, and everything that He did, you know, uh, right from creating the world to creating us to incarnation to his uh, death on the cross everything that he did he did out of love so even as we you know when we become uh, uh, partakers of that uh, divine grace that salvation that he has provided for us we become part of his family you know something that becomes a characteristic of each one of us is love you know because god's love uh, transforms us his love uh you know um uh and motivates us to love others to forgive others uh and i think you know if that element is missing in each one of us then we can uh you know it's we can question that no we're not question but we can think about if that person is really you know um saved you know that person has really accepted jesus maybe as their savior but not as their lord because if there is no love that transcends or you know is transforming us or love that is translating in and through our lives in everything that we do you know uh, it just shows that maybe we've received salvation we've just accepted christ as our saviors so that we can go to heaven but we've not made him uh, as our lord of our lives of every area so the best proof of our conversion uh, and the recommendation for the gospel is uh, love. But we know that, you know, uh, we can't say that I have love. Love has to translate itself in action. Uh, silent love is not enough. Uh, it does not do good to anyone. So, you know, even as we look into our own lives this morning, we need to look at ourselves in various areas of our life. If we are really showing the love of Christ in uh, to people, to our family, to our spouse, to our children, uh, people that we are relating to, the also to the body of Christ, the saints, the people that we work along with, the people who work for us, you know, are we showing them uh, the love of God? Because that is the characteristic of who God is. God is love and he wants us, uh, you know, uh, the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength. The second greatest commandment is to love your neighbor as your um, self. So here, you know, uh, Paul is just, um, uh, you know, even as he writes to various churches, he, you know, he acknowledges their love that they have for Christ Jesus, acknowledges their love that they have for uh, the saints, like he has written to the church at Colossae in, Coloss in, the, in the letter uh, or the book of Colossians, but he also is writing personally here to Philemon and he's saying that, you know, he's heard of his love. That means he's heard of, uh, you know, the good reports that people uh, have given about Philemon, how he is uh, a loving person, generous, you know, because he has a church uh, uh, there in his house, meeting at his house and how he is, uh, you know, shows his love to people who are poor, uh, the poor saints, the poor people, and I think that should be also characteristic of us uh, as believers should be love and faith, love towards others and faith uh, in the Lord Jesus Christ. If we have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, it does translate or transcends into love uh, uh, towards others and towards other believers. So he says that, you know, he's, he's thanking God for Philemon, because of his love and faith towards Jesus and also towards all the uh, saints. Verse 6, that the sharing of your faith may become effective by the acknowledgement of every good thing which is uh, in you in Christ uh, Jesus. Now, in, uh, uh, in this whole uh, letter to Philemon, uh, this one was, uh, you know, uh, the commentary writers find it very difficult to translate. And so much is written about just this verse, verse 6, uh, in, uh, you know, because uh, the phrase sharing of your faith, which many commentary writers have found it very difficult uh, 
uh, to exegete, to uh, translate, to explain. Uh, it's because of the Greek word that is used there is koinonia. And koinonia basically means um, three words. It means sharing, it means fellowship and participation. So, you know, because of this Greek word koinonia, uh, which means, you know, sharing of your faith, the word koinonia, uh, sharing is the Greek word uh, which is used there is koinonia and uh, so they're trying to uh, find out the best possible interpretation for this phrase the sharing of your faith so you know the commentary writers or theologians have come up with three possible meanings uh, firstly because this word koinonia means sharing so in that uh, uh, you know uh, uh, interpretation of the word uh, sharing or the meaning of the word sharing it means that you know it could mean that you know that the sharing in the Christian faith that it might be a prayer that the faith which Philemon and Paul shared in uh, basically will lead Philemon deeper and deeper into uh, Christian truth so using this word sharing uh, you know some commentary writers uh, say it means that you know basically stop paul is talking about uh, sharing in the christian faith uh, so it might be a prayer that the faith which philemon and paul share uh, in christ jesus their faith which they share in the gospel in the truth in christ jesus may lead philemon deeper and deeper into the christian truth okay so that is one interpretation because koinonia means sharing Another interpretation which commentary writers have come up with this uh, uh, phrase sharing of your faith, uh, because koinonia also means fellowship. Uh, some commentary writers say that it can mean, uh, you know, that this may be a prayer that Christian fellowship may lead Philemon even more deeply into the truth. So they're kind of finding, you know, what are the possibilities of interpreting this phrase sharing your faith in the best possible way so using the word fellowship they're saying it could mean that paul is saying that you know it will be a prayer that the christian fellowship may lead philemon even more deeply into the truth and the third meaning uh because uh you know koinonia also means sharing it can mean an act of sharing and in that case this uh, verse will basically mean that it's my prayer, Paul is basically saying, it's my prayer that your way of generously sharing all that you have with the saints, with the people around who live around you, Philemon, will lead you more and more deeply into the knowledge of the good things which lead to Christ. And uh, commentary writers say that, you know, the, the best possible meaning of this phrase you know, sharing your faith in verse 6 could mean this, the act of sharing, you know, uh, the third uh, interpretation which I gave, the third possible meaning which I gave, the act of sharing because Paul is basically saying, hey Philemon, it's my prayer that the way you generously share all that you have with people around you, with people in the church, the saints and believers, will lead you more and more deeply into the knowledge of the good things which lead to uh, Christ. So theologians and commentary writers say that the, the, the correct meaning could be the third one, the third interpretation, which means an act of sharing. So obviously, you know, Christian generosity was something that was characteristic of Philemon. Uh, you know, he not only had love towards people, but he showed that in action. Uh, and, uh, you know, the way that he treated people who came to his uh, house for fellowship, the house church that met there, and also many saints who were journeying, you know, traveling, uh, you know, would come and stay in Philemon's home, which means his home was open uh, for the saints, for the believers, for those who were traveling, even if he did not know who they were, you know, and they just found themselves very rested and refreshed in Philemon's um, house. So the third possible meaning would, could be that, you know, what uh, Paul basically meant by this phrase, sharing of your faith, 
is that he, the way he generously shared uh, uh, his resources, the, 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 uh, the way God has blessed him financially, will lead Philemon more and more deeply into the knowledge of the good things uh, in Christ uh, Jesus. Okay. So, you know, it's possible that Paul means that the sharing of material things, you know, also could be prompted by faith. Uh, you know, it's when you have faith in Christ Jesus that you are also willing to share your uh, personal belongings, the material things that God has blessed you with, your possessions, your uh, finances, the money that you have, you know, sharing it with others. And this is also prompted by faith. So that is the best possible uh, interpretation or the closest meaning to the phrase sharing of your faith may become effective by the acknowledgement of every good thing which is uh, in you in Christ uh, Jesus. Verse 7, for we have great joy and consolation in your love because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed by you, brother. So Paul has... Uh, you know, experience or derived much joy and encouragement from Philemon's love. And he just takes time to affirm this fact, just to acknowledge this fact. And Paul remembered how wonderfully Philemon had just met the needs of uh, other Christians by refreshing their hearts, people who just came and stayed in his house, people who were journeying, passing by Colossae, you know, Christian believers, the way he just refreshed their hearts, the way he just blesses people uh, as well. And uh, this is not something that he, that Philemon does once in a while, but these are regular acts and they have lasting effects. And that is why, you know, Paul um, has heard so much about the way Philemon just blesses others with what God has blessed him. So because how do we know that this is something that is not some he does uh, once in a while, but is regular acts and lasting effects because he says that, you know, um, because the hearts of the saints, you know, have been refreshed by you, brother. So the hearts means, you know, many people uh, who have, and saints, which means plural, many people who have been blessed by him, uh, and have been refreshed and, you know, may have, they would have met Paul and they would have, you know, shared their uh, uh, ministry experiences and shared how they went to Colossae and how they were blessed by uh, Philemon. You know, so Paul is saying that Philemon has refreshed the inmost feelings and very self of the saints who visited him or stayed at his um, house. So something that we can learn from Philemon here you know, uh, even as, uh, you know, God has blessed us in various ways, uh, you know, whatever it is, whether it's in small things, big things, you know, we always constantly have to uh, bless others, refresh their hearts, you know, uh, speak into their lives, bless them, and also, you know, gift uh, uh, financially or meet their needs, times of their struggles, you know, just be there emotionally uh, as well, but also, you know, materially just blessing people even as uh, uh, God has uh, blessed us. Because these are things that count for eternity. You know, these are things that have a lasting impact on people. Uh, you know, I just attended a funeral on, um, on Thursday and the pastor was saying, you know, uh, the person who's dead is already gone. He's not able to see all uh, the flowers that we bring, the tributes that we uh, give them, the nice words that we speak to them about them, you know, because they're dead and gone. But, you know, when they are living, uh, you know, can we do things uh, that would, you know, refresh their hearts, that would bless them, that would bring a smile on their face, that would bless their heart, you know, just get flowers or, you know, have a meal with them, say nice things to them, encourage them by just, you know, uh, speaking positive about who they are, what they have done, how they have blessed others, how they have been a blessing to you. So sometimes we get into this whole, uh, whole rut of doing things for God, you know, we get so busy, but we kind of miss out on just smiling at people, just blessing people, uh, just speaking to the lives of people, just thanking people for what they have done. 
taking even people for granted, even in our, in our family, our spouses or our parents or our children, uh, but just taking the time, you know, uh, uh, just to speak encouraging words, just to do something nice, you know, which will have a lasting impact. I think when we do that, people will live a day more. It brings so much of joy. It brings so much of uh, happiness. You know, uh, just positive words just blesses people. Uh, you know, and make their lives so much more uh, fruitful and happy, uh, and uh, you know, just gives them the strength to move on. So we can learn that from Philemon as well. Okay, we'll move on. Uh, any questions so far before we look at verses eight to sixteen? Okay, if there are no questions, then we will look at verses 8 to 16. Can one of you please read verses 8 to 16, please? 8 to 16, it reads, Therefore, although in Christ I could be bold and order you to do what you ought to do, yet I prefer to appeal to you on the basis of love. It is as none other than Paul, an old man, and now also a prisoner of Christ Jesus, that I appeal to you for my son Onismos, who Onismos, sorry, who became my son while I was in chains. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he has become useful both to you and to me. I am sending him who is my very heart. I'm sending him who is my very heart back to you. I would have liked to keep him with me so that he could take your place in helping me while I'm in chains for the gospel. But I did not want to do anything without your consent so that any favor you do would not seem forced, but would be voluntary. Perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a little while was that you might have him back forever, no longer as a slave, but better than a slave as a dear brother. He is very dear to me, but even dear to you, both as a fellow man and as a brother in the Lord. So if you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. If, you, if he has done you any wrong or owes you anything, charge it to me. Amen. Thank you, Say. So Paul goes on here to request Philemon uh, to receive his uh, runaway slave Onesimus back. And in verse 8, he says, Therefore, though I might be very bold in Christ to com uh, command you what is fitting, so Paul is saying, uh, you know, he could use authority that he has, authority as an apostle, as a leader, um, and as the authority that he has over Philemon because he was the one who led him to Christ. Uh, you know, uh, so Paul is saying he could use his authority to command uh, Philemon to receive his runaway slave uh, with kindness uh, rather than vengeance. But he says he prefers uh, to make this appeal uh, basis, uh, uh, you know, he, he prefers to make this appeal on the basis of uh, their Christian relationship, their Christian love, the love that they have as fellow believers in Christ Jesus, as brothers in Christ, uh, and the love that binds them together as believers in Christ Jesus. So he says, uh, you know, he's laying aside his, uh, authority and he's not commanding Philemon, uh, you know, to receive his slave back on the basis of the authority that Paul can exert, can use. Uh, but here he's preferring to use, uh, you know, uh, appeal on the basis of uh, the love that they share in Christ Jesus, that they are brothers in Christ, the Christian love, the Christian fellowship. The, the relationship that they have in Christ Jesus because of their faith in Christ Jesus and the love that binds them uh, together in uh, in Christ. And he he goes on later on to say why he's not commanding uh, 
Philemon, but why he's uh, making an appeal uh, to him on the basis of love. We'll look at that in a little while. And then he says, you know, uh, I might be very bold in Christ to command. So the, the word bold here basis, basically means boldness, confidence, uh, frankness, or just being open and plain. But Paul is saying, you know, I have much boldness and openness. Or he's saying, I could be very bold uh, to give an authoritative command. Uh, but Paul is saying that, you know, he bases his boldness because of who he is in Christ or that Christ gives him uh, the boldness to tell Philemon um, what to do. Uh, but he's saying, you know, rather than that, you know, he's saying that I basically would not use my command, my authority, but I would make an appeal on the basis of uh, love. So he says, you know, um, he will do what is fitting. Uh, some versions say that uh, it means, uh, you know, some versions translate what is fitting as what is required or what should be done. So Paul is telling Philemon that with the boldness that Christ gives him, uh, he can command Philemon to do what is required and fitting or what is proper for Philemon as a Christian to do uh, in the circumstances concerning Onesimus. But, you know, uh, uh, he goes on in verse 9, which says, Yet for love's sake, I rather appeal to you, being such as a one as Paul, the aged, and now also as a prisoner of Christ Jesus. So he says, yet, which means rather, rather than using my boldness, my command, uh, which I have, uh, you know, the authority, the boldness, the command in Christ Jesus, because he has given me the authority uh, and I can use that authority and I can command you in boldness, uh, Philemon, to do what is required and fitting what is proper for you to do as a Christian uh, in the circumstances concerning uh, Onesimus. But yet, which means rather, uh, Paul says, I could, uh, you know, I would rather do it uh, in love. I would make my appeal in love rather than using my authority and my uh, boldness. So uh, the love he's basically talking here is about the Christian love that they share in Christ Jesus or the brotherly love that they share. And he says, being such a one as Paul, so he's reminding Philemon and laying the ground for, you know, Paul's uh, right to command. Uh, but he's saying that, you know, um, I could do that because I am Paul, the apostle, but I would rather not do it based on that uh, authority. I would do it rather on love. And then he, he, you know, talks about his age and uh, that he's a prisoner of Christ Jesus, which means he's just basically, you know, trying to bring about uh, asking Philemon to be sympathetic towards him. Uh, you know, uh, based on his circumstances. So he's saying, I'm not using any command, I'm not using any boldness, but I'm plead pleading to you of making this appeal in love uh, based also on sympathy because I'm uh, uh, aged. So Paul is saying that he uh, doing this as an old man, you know, which means he's someone in some, uh, some of the versions, it does not have the age, but uh, uh, the translation there is old man. Um, so he says that, you know, I'm doing this because I'm an old man, which means, you know, someone who's wise and experienced um, uh, through the years, you know, who's carried authority through the years. And also he's making an appeal not only as uh, somebody who is uh, an old man in terms of age, wise and experienced, but also as a prisoner who belongs to Christ uh, Jesus. So here he's uh, the prisoner, he's playing on the words. Uh, basically, Paul is writing from uh, prison. Uh, so he's saying that, hey, I'm a prisoner, I'm in chains because of the gospel, but also as a prisoner who belongs to Christ, which means, you know, Paul is saying that I have made this choice uh, to be that uh, a slave, that born servant who has uh, given myself completely to the will, to the command, to the obedience 
of the Lord uh, Jesus Christ. And in verse 10, he says, I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten while in chains. So he's saying, you know, I appeal, I urge, I beseech. Uh, so the focus being on Paul's appeal to Philemon on behalf of his runaway slave Onesimus, uh, and uh, an appeal that he makes on the, uh, on the basis of the ground of love. You know, how he writes about Onesimus, just like how he writes about Timothy, my son in the faith, uh, how he writes about Titus uh, as also his son, and also how he spoke about some of his converts, like, like Titus and Timothy. Um, we read about uh, this in 1 Corinthians 4.17, uh, when he writes about this, Titus as his son in Titus chapter 1, verse 4. Uh, and not only does Paul refer to uh, my son or you know, uh, to individuals, but also he refers to uh, the churches or the believers or the saints in churches. He refers them to as his children. He refers to the church at uh, Corinth as his children. Uh, he says, he writes this in First Corinthians chapter 4, verse 14. He also refers to the church uh, at, that meets at Galatia. When he's writing Galatians, um, the book of Galatians, the letter of Galatians, Galatians chapter 4, verse 19, where he also refers to the church as uh, children. So here we see that, you know, um, it's basically Paul uh, takes great joy, uh, great happiness, um, you know, in looking at the people that he has uh, uh, mentor the people that he has brought to the faith, uh, the people that he is looking after as his own children. You know, he he feels a great sense of responsibility, that spiritual uh, ownership as a father of the house, just taking care of the children. So it just teaches us something here that, you know, some of us are fathers and mothers in the church, and it's our responsibility to uh, father, mother, those in the faith, uh, those in the church, uh, you know, mentor them, uh, build them up in the faith, strengthen them up as uh, somebody who's mature, somebody who's grown up, you know, just um, uh, enabling them, teaching them, uh, guiding them and helping them uh, in their walk, in their journey of faith. And that is what, you know, God calls us to do. We see Jesus himself, you know, nurtured, mentored, uh, the 12 disciples, and they went on uh, to, uh, you know, nurture and mentor so many who carried on the work. And uh, so also Paul, you know, Paul, uh, it was not one man show, but he, you know, just invested into the lives of people, even as he, you know, went around preaching, teaching, ministering, but he took the time to, uh, uh, you know, mentor people, to raise them up. And we see that, you know, when Paul left, the work did not die along with him, but the work grew and multiplied because of, uh, you know, how he, as a father, nurtured the children. And, you know, the whole thing of him writing these letters to Titus, to Timothy, to the church at Corinth, uh, Galatia, and other churches, Ephesians and Colossians and uh, other churches as well, the church at Rome, was because he had that father heart to father them, to nurture them uh, in that faith. And I think that's very, very important uh, because that's what Christ wants us to do uh, as well. You know, um, that is what he kept saying, you know, wait in Jerusalem, you'll be endued or clothed with power from on high. Uh, and go and preach and teach and uh, uh, baptize, uh, you know. So that is what Christ has asked us and he wants us to continue. And so even as Paul has done that, we too need to be those fathers and mothers in the faith who are nurturing and building others up. Uh, what a joy it must have been for Paul, you know, under those even miserable circumstances as a prison uh, to lead uh, this a runaway slave Onesimus uh, to Christ. So we see that, you know, even when Paul was uh, physically in chains, 
you know, uh, he did not limit himself from ministering, from investing into people's life, uh, from writing to people, encouraging them, you know, establishing order uh, uh, in the church. Um, but, you know, just see his focus. He was not, uh, uh, you know, he was not taken up with the circumstances. He did not yield with the difficult circumstances that he was going through. He must have felt overwhelmed, but he did not let that uh, kill his passion, his desire, his love uh, for Christ. So, you know, even as we journey in our walk with Christ, things are not going to be easy because we we studied in, uh, in Second Timothy those, you know, uh, who, uh, you know, uh, uh, are part of the gospel, they will suffer persecution. That is part of what we receive, part of the package of our salvation, of the blessings that we receive. Along with that package comes persecution as well. So we will face difficulties, uh, we will face uh, challenges, uh, but that should not kind of stop us from, you know, um, doing or pursuing the call that God has placed on our life. Uh, we need to continue running our race with perseverance and with endurance and no circumstances, you know, uh, whether it's in season or out of season, just preach, teach, minister, uh, uh, you know, just impart into the lives of people, just like Paul did, even when he was in chains. So physical chains are no limitations to spiritual uh, fruitfulness. We can be fruitful even when we are going through challenges and difficulties, even old age is not a restriction for us uh, to, you know, be, uh, to extend God's kingdom, uh, to fulfill his plan and purpose for our life, uh, to build God's kingdom as well. You know, um, and, you know, uh, Paul just uh, called himself as an old man and now was a prisoner of Christ Jesus. So, uh, look at uh, his whole perspective of ministry that irrespective of uh, you know, whether he was beaten, shipwrecked, whatever he went through, persecutions, difficulties, his age, uh, being in chains, nothing could stop him from uh, you know, pursuing the call and doing what God has uh, entrusted him to do, portion him uh, to do. So we do not know how many people Paul led to Christ while in prison. Uh, from Philippians, we understand that, you know, the guards who were chained to uh, him in prison were given the gospel uh, without a chance to escape because uh, Paul says this or writes this in Philippians chapter 1, verse 12 and 13. He says, but I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel so that it has become evident to the whole palace guard and to all the rest that my chains are in Christ. So we see that even when he was chained, you know, or in prison, uh, he even shared the gospel with the palace guards. And uh, even when he was testifying before them, you know, he basically gave a testimony not of what he has done or trying to defend himself, but actually you know, share the gospel, share the truth about Jesus uh, Christ. And such a powerful uh, testimony of this man, uh, Paul, and something that we can uh, learn and imbibe in our lives as well. Verse 11, who once was unprofitable to you, but now is profitable to you and uh, to me. So Paul states that Onesimus, you know, he's actually playing on words here. Uh, the name Onesimus basically means profitable or useless. So uh, his own name, Onesimus, means profitable or useful. So Paul is using the uh, meaning of his name and playing on words here. So he's saying that, you know, Onesimus was once useless, uh, which means, you know, he uh, when he was a, your slave, maybe, you know, he was not heeding to you. He was not doing his tasks. Uh, he was being a difficult slave. And also when he ran away, it could have put so much of difficulty uh, uh, in uh, Philemon's life, uh, you know, but he's saying, uh, but, you know, he's now useful, which means that, you know, 
now that he has accepted Christ, now that he has come to know his identity of who he is in Christ, you know, that identity in Christ has made him a strong uh, person and also strong enough to accept his own uh, physical identity here in this world, that he is a slave and that as a, a believer in Christ, you know, his identity has translated into him uh, and who he is physically as a slave, knowing his responsibilities now, knowing that what he had done is wrong, knowing that he has to go back to his uh, master and ask for forgiveness and work for him and be a good slave. So he's saying he was once useless, but now he's become useful because of his identity in Christ, that new identity has given him a sense of new purpose and identity of who he is in this physical realm as a slave as um, and his calling as a slave. And he's willing to be uh, useful both to you, Philemon, and to me. So he says, but now, which means, but nowadays he has become useful both to you and which means both to Philemon and to um, uh, to Paul. So in some ways, you know, Onesimus has become profitable to Paul. Uh, perhaps, you know, um, he served as an assistant to Paul during his house arrest in, uh, in Roman imprisonment. You know, maybe he was running errands for, uh, uh, for Paul. He was doing things for Paul. And so Philemon's runaway slave, Onesimus, was now profitable, uh, 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 you know, uh, to Paul because he was helping him so much. Uh, maybe he was unprofitable to Philemon because he had escaped, but he has become profitable to Paul. And uh, since Philemon loved Paul, if Onesimus, uh, you know, helped Paul, actually he was helping Philemon in one way. So, uh, Oh, Paul is telling Philemon, look at it this way. You know, both of us are good brothers in Christ. We love each other. You know, if uh, your slave who was un is unprofitable to you now because he's run away but has been profitable to me, you know, in one way or the other, he has been profitable to you as well because he has been of great use, uh, great profit uh, and usefulness uh, to me uh, when I was in Roman imprisonment. So by making this clear to Philemon, you know, Paul is gently hinting that uh, he would like to have Onimus, uh, sorry, Onesimus stay back, uh, you know, so that he can be of great help uh, to Paul, um, though he could command Philemon to do this and say, hey, Philemon, you know, your runaway slave is of great uh, use for me. Anyway, you have many slaves, uh, so, you know, you don't need uh, Onesimus. He's of great use for me. And now I'm in chains. I can't do anything much. So he's doing everything for me. So he could command uh, uh, Philemon to, you know, uh, that he would keep back Onesimus. But, you know, uh, uh, Paul uh, chooses not to do that. We see that he chooses to obey the law by sending Onesimus back to Philemon. And also he's doing what is right in the eyes of God. So we see that Paul not only writes to Titus and Timothy, how young men, old men, young women, older women, slaves, um, you know, how they need to conduct themselves, how as saints, as believers, we need to conduct ourselves with them. Uh, so Paul is not just commanding others and writing to others and saying how different people have to conduct themselves in order in the Church of Christ. But we see that he himself, or, you know, even writing to the people at Rome, to Titus, to Timothy, that, you know, they have to obey the uh, the government, uh, obey the laws of the land, obey the government. Uh, and we see that Paul himself, you know, was to doing that. He is obeying the law here by sending back Onesimus because that is what the law required. You know, if you found a runaway slave, you have to send them back to the master. And, uh, you know, that um, <clears throat> he's asking permission uh, from Philemon if, you know, he could send back Onesimus because he's a great help. So we see that Paul um, 
you know, uh, even though he's a great apostle, he has great authority, doesn't misuse his authority, which is something that we all need to learn. We can be in places of authority, of position. We can tell others uh, what is the rules and the law, but we can find ourselves sometimes not obeying it or doing it or we think that we are above the law or we are above what we have put in place <clears throat> because we are the boss but it's important that you know as uh, we want adhere, others to adhere to the law we also need to uh, follow it ourselves so you know uh, uh, he's saying that I'm going to send him back because that is the right thing to do so it is not until Onesimus was found in Christ. We see here in these verses that he has become useful or profitable. But it's a general principle that, you know, we all become, we find our usefulness, our purpose when we accept Christ Jesus as our Lord and uh, Savior. Because in Christ, we find our, our purpose, we find our identity, we find our usefulness, we find... Uh, uh, the purpose why God has created us and also it's only in Christ that we find our identity. So here Onesimus, you know, finds not only his identity in Christ, he also knows that, you know, uh, his calling that he can also be useful in uh, Christ. So some of us, even as, uh, you know, we might be in a place where we find our lives useless or unprofitable, or, uh, you know, we are kind of uh, uh, looking at our own self-worth, our self-identity. Uh, if we are born again Christians, you know, we need to get back into looking at our identity in Christ because that is who we are. And, uh, you know, the great price that Christ has paid for our identity and what he thinks of us and how he looks at us is how we need to see ourselves and look at ourselves and not believe the lies of the enemy and how what he tells us we are, but look at ourselves in how Christ looks at us and the identity that he has purchased or the identity that we have um, in Christ. Or if some of us are also in that place where we find ourselves useless, you know, um, Christ has taken us out of, you know, uh, that mighty pit of sin and uh, uselessness to become and put us on a rock. You know, the rock is Christ himself. And, uh, you know, uh, he has brought us to a place where he sees us as uh, people who are uh, created in his image, in his likeness, with a plan, with a purpose. Uh, the plans that he has are so great, so big, because he's a great big God. He has great big plans for us, and uh, he can use us mightily for uh, his kingdom. But it's important for us to turn our focus um, not on things that uh, we look at, you know, ourselves as useless or, you know, that we don't have any sense of identity, but look at us as Christ sees us and what he has um, purchased for um, us. So here in these verses, we see that Onesimus rediscovered that he was um, a slave of Philemon, and uh, he knew this even before, but he actually lived in a denial mode, you know, and that is the reality of him uh, running away because he did not want to be that slave. Uh, but it's a fundamental truth, you know, that uh, being in Christ means that we start off accepting what we are and where we are and where Christ is uh, taking us to. So, you know, we always look up, up ahead and see where Christ is taking us, where we belong and what he thinks of us and the great plans that he has uh, for us. So Onesimus is wanting, uh, you know, not just because Paul wants to send him back, but also Onesimus wants to return back to his master uh, he's accepted his position that he is a slave um, and, you know, um, that he is a slave in reality, but in Christ that he has been set free and he is using this newfound truth or this new freedom, you know, uh, to go back uh, 
to fulfill his responsibility. Uh, so Paul sends Onesibus back to his place from which he ran away. And we know that uh, Onesimus accepts Paul's advice. Uh, how do we know that? Uh, because he did it willingly, not just because Paul is sending him, is because he could have run away again. And uh, the fact that, you know, he uh, accepted Paul's uh, proposal, or he accepted this whole fact that, hey, you know, yes, I am a runaway slave. I've done something wrong, but now in my new identity in Christ, I need to go and ask for forgiveness. I need to be that a uh, slave who, you know, um, works uh, and is useful and profitable for my masters, serve him like I'm serving Christ. Uh, and the fact that he took it upon himself and he accepted this uh, is a very fact that, or the proof that we have this uh, letter or this epistle in the Bible, you know, is a proof that he did not go back uh, uh, or he did not run away, but he went uh, back to his master on his free will and in doing so, he obeyed God and not just Paul, because Paul asked him to do, but he had, uh, you know, was obeying the will of God, obeying what God has uh, uh, has portioned for him in his life with this new sense of identity and purpose that he has. Okay, we'll stop here. We'll come back and look at verses 12 onwards uh, after the break. So we'll see you all after the break. And we'll take any questions you'll have after the break. Thank you.